Hey, Foot Clan, we got a great show planned for you today. Some dark horse teams answering some big time fantasy football questions. Before we get into it, I want to remind you less than 10 days until the ultimate draft kit is released. You can get it at pre order pricing right now. Check it out ultimatedraftkit.com. Hi, this is Alex from Houston from the Newbies Dynasty League, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. <laughs> oh, welcome in. Oh, welcome in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what, what was going on over there? I had my eyes closed. Uh, was- I'll bring it up here. Welcome into the Fantasy Footballers, by the way. A great show for you today. Very excited to get into it. Tons of incredible fantasy football insight. Uh, get ready. Just prepare yourself. You've come to expect it, but we will begin with why I was <laughs> laughing to begin the show. Uh, before, as Brooks was getting us set up and we're getting the cameras going and we're getting ready to, to start the show, we, we always have a few minutes to... To jive, right? To, to chat. Mm-hmm. And somehow, some way, we got onto the topic of Sandra Bullock. Sure, <laughs> right, of course, because who it's- is? I mean, just the consensus would res- just understand and acknowledge the fact that she is a beautiful woman. Well, they, yeah, definitely. And especially when we talked about because we were talking about just you know, speed, the, the movie the, Speed. The, yeah, yeah, and then the childhood, childhood crush on Sandra Bullock. Yeah, and then. It, Jason has a far different take. Well, no, it's not different than everybody's. It's just that I think she's a dog. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. No, I'm come not. Come on. Look, she she is uh, no, she's, she's Hollywood. Beautiful. She's beautiful. She's a beautiful woman. If I saw her in person, she's beautiful. But when the standards are, when, when I'm a boy and I'm watching Speed. Oh, Boo. Boo. When I'm watching Speed. Boo. I, no, she was. Blah. So Jason didn't agree with, like, he wasn't. She wasn't on your young man's list of, no. you know, I remember Alicia Silverstone, right? From the early days, Clueless now, or something. Now you're bringing me into my manhood. Uh, but somehow there's a disconnect between Jason and Sandra Bullock. And so he sent me a picture of Michael Jackson <laughs> right before the show started trying to compare draw lines. No, that, is that what the situation was? Actually, this is a picture of Sandra Bullock. No, it is not. <laughs> no, this is the worst... I wish I hadn't brought Why it Why did up. you bring this I'm up? So, I didn't think it would go here. How many listeners this? do we just lose because of Jason? Seriously. Well, look, both of you. Wait, why, you you mad at me? How are you mad at He's me? You brought Sa- it up. He's defending I her I thought honor. we would get some enjoyment out of it. Clearly, we haven't. <laughs> Let's transition, okay? Uh, Hit the intro again. With great speed. Who's your dark horse team for the 2019 season? That's the question this morning. Last year... Mike, you took the Bears. I took the Ravens. Those turned out pretty, pretty, pretty well. Pretty, pretty good. This would be a good time to highlight Jason took the Giants. Yeah. I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> right. But after that beginning to the show. Well, look, if if we're talking bad takes, I'll, I'll bring up my dark horse right off the bat. My dark horse for 2019 is a post-hype sleeper. It's a team that a lot of people thought were going to be a Super Bowl contender last year because of their unbelievable defense. The Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, they were atrocious last year. They had no run game. Their offensive line got injured. Their quarterback was Blake Bortles. People thought they could win a Super Bowl or be a contender with Blake Bortles. Now, I'm not a huge Nick Foles believer. You're also uh, very much on Team Bortles. Uh, right, uh, for fantasy, so, absolutely. <laughs> like Jason's no, but going never. through all these, people thought all these, like, he's looking in the mirror talking <laughs> about himself. No, ne- never as like a, a real <laughs> life, but for fantasy, Blake Bortles was great because he ran the I ball. I got a sure. snake, man. <laughs> but Playing in real hits. life, while I'm not a gigantic fan of Nick Foles, <clears throat> he is better for an NFL team than Blake Bortles. I think he'll make fewer mistakes. He'll be He'll be an upgrade. That says, hey, you can't stack the box. You look at how injured the offensive line for the Jacksonville Jaguars was last season. And and not only do they get the left side of their line back with Cam Robinson, 
Uh, they they mm-hmm. had Norwell, their huge free agent signing last year that was injured. But then in the draft, a lot of people's number one tackle, Juwan Taylor, falls to them with their second pick, and they get him to plug in on the right side of the line. So the offensive mm-hmm. line is going to be better. My Pretty much my favorite player in the draft uh, on both sides of the ball, Josh Allen on defense, fell to them at six. So I think their team has really improved, and their defense was not bad last year. Like, it might have let people down for fantasy purposes, but in the NFL, when it comes to yards, points, they were good. I feel like they've gotten better. Their offensive line is going to let Leonard Fournette run the ball, and uh, they upgraded the quarterback. So I I think even though it's a tough division – I I understand the argument because that team's predicated on defense and running the football. I think it's – I think Nick Foles is this year's case Keenum, though. That's the the situation that like yeah I don't disagree he had a magical run in Philadelphia multiple times but he he had done that before like he had a twenty seven touchdown two interception season with oh, Chip that, Kelly that season was so great and you know what he got to do is he got to go be a starting quarterback for the Rams well and now that he didn't have a chance with Jeff Fisher Jeff Fisher but good friend of Twitter buddy of mine having a chance not having a chance whatever you want to say he had you know. A week one performance over 200 yards, then he went 10 straight games without 200 yards passing. I don't know if Nick Foles has matured or become something different. He's going to be a game manager in Jacksonville. That's why I'm not eager about him in fantasy, but I could see Jacksonville having a better season. It's just a tough division. Yeah, Nick Foles is my 29th quarterback in fantasy. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Exactly where Bullock was on your list growing up. Ah, That's way too high. All right, I'm going to go with... The Raiders. I'm not playing it safe here, boys. I'm going with the 4-12 and 12 Raiders as my dark horse team. I don't know how you can have a better offseason. I really don't. They had so much draft capital. They invested on the defense, and they invested in free agency, right? Uh, Farrell with the fourth pick. LaMarcus Joyner in free agency. On offense, they stole Antonio Brown, the best player in football at the wide receiver position. They then paired him with Tyrell Williams. And I know we like... Uh, making fun of Derek Carr, Mm -hmm. but this was a player who two years ago led the Raiders to their first playoff berth since 2002. He was third in MVP voting. He didn't even bother to play the playoff game, though. Uh, What a quitter. I know. That was an unfortunate end of the season, but it's interesting. According to Pro Football Focus, the top three highest single-season deep passing accuracy rates belong to Russell Wilson in 2016, Derek Carr last year and Derek Carr in 2016. What? So he is the number one deep passer in the league. And now you add, uh, you take away what he had, which was nothing, and you give him Antonio Brown and Tyrell. Who, what's Tyrell Williams known for? Deep ball. Deep ball. That mm-hmm. just feels like a lie. Yeah. It does feel like a lie, but he, he has weapons that are excellent on deep ball Um uh, passes that's what they they're they're known for Tyrell and Antonio Brown can both get open deep so Derek Carr who will stretch the field they've reinforced all over the place they paid Trent Brown big money now whatever you want to believe about Trent Brown the tackle they've fixed their problem when when Derek or they've tried to fix their problem on the offensive line it's going to help Josh Jacobs who was also an addition Hunter Renfro I just see a team that's gotten so much better and I think that they have an opportunity to make a move this year all right, I'm going with uh, the Atlanta Falcons. They they finished under 500. They're much much like the Jacksonville Jaguars. People thought they would be better, but their offense was outstanding. It's their offense is too good for them to not make a run back to the playoffs. They were the only team to score over 400 points and actually end up as a sub 500 team. They did finish the season strong, and if you remember what happened to them, their entire defense just seemed to. Uh, Oh, yeah. Be injured one by one in those first few weeks of the season. They also had a, a strong draft up, upgrading their offensive line. So I really like the Atlanta Falcons to bounce back and win that division this I year. I just I remember the beginning win the of division. Last, yes. win the, I was going to ask you how you think that division. Yeah, I will, think I think they will beat out the Saints next year. Oh man, wow. I find that I find that difficult to believe. That just feels like a lie. <laughs> as Jason would say. Not quite as extreme a lie as Derek, as Derek Carr, Carr being the greatest <laughs> deep passer of all time. Isn't that incredible? It's a lie. It's a, but and, and for him to be two of the best three seasons. Well, so we're talking accuracy. So, Correct. So like, now, you would make the argument that he threw like eight deep balls. 
That would be where I would go. But uh, <laughs> give me the raw numbers. When he seven th- of eight. Here's the thing: when you <laughs> throw deep, I mean, you you now can you can with those other guys. It'll be interesting. I think Derek Carr bounces back. There was a report that he was quite annoyed with the fact that they were there were all the rumors about them taking another quarterback. Has so. he watched himself play? <clears throat> no, never has. Mm. Sometimes um, you got to take a look. I encourage you to check us out on Twitter at the FF Ballers. The Foot Clan community is over at jointhefoot.com. And one of the cool perks over there, which is great for this time of the season, is not only an extra episode in case two is not enough. Maybe two's too many after the intro to today's show. But if two's not enough, you want an extra episode, you go to jointhefoot.com, become a member of the Foot Clan, support the podcast, and you also get access to the Foot Clan leagues. So if you're looking to get into a dynasty league or a keeper league or just a, a redraft league with some good people, which is what makes a good league, we provide that resource at footclanleagues.com through the Foot Clan community. And uh, I did want to mention this as well. There is a, uh, a Superflex 2QB article up on the website. We've had a lot of requests for a super flex two quarterback art strategy article and uh we've listened so michael weinrich he put that up on the website one of our writing staff you can check that out at the fantasyfootballers.com news and notes from around the league presented by sleeper all right We'll try to get through these pretty quick. Uh, Patriots have signed Julian Edelman to a two-year, $18 million extension through 2021. That's fantastic. They don't believe he's slowing down because he's not. Could, a lot of people have drawn the line between this contract and maybe when Brady would be done, hypothetically. Hmm. Uh, uh, here they are actually working on an extension with Brady as well. Well, it's working. It's working yeah. well. Things are going well in New England. Pete Carroll said Chris Carson had, quote, a little work done on his knee and should be Mm. back in a couple weeks. Hmm. That is, quote, worse than no work done. But it it is also better than out significantly going to miss camp. I mean, if you're back in a couple weeks, could have been a cleanup procedure. What we do know about Pete Carroll, when it comes to injuries, he is locked in, man. He gives you 100% the truth. (laughs) That is sarcasm. Yeah, uh, Chris Carson likely to miss training camp and preseason. That's my call based off of Pete Carroll. Look, what's your real take? That this is bad. That Pete Carroll always, always has the rose-colored glass. I like Pete Carroll the dude. But when it comes to fantasy football, he is among the least trustworthy guys, especially when it comes to injuries. So this is really bad news to me. Well, for Chris, for, for Chris, Chris Carson. Carson. Yeah, yeah, that's one in the context of Chris Carson. All right. So you think but there's one thing to say that he's vague. It's another thing to say that he's telling you a lie about something that happened. You then are choosing to believe that he is lying about him being back in a couple of weeks, being yes. fine for camp? Yeah, look back at last offseason. You should create one of those uh, paper ring things with two weeks. Okay. And uh, you cut one look. off every day and then see if Carson's back at the end of it. Carson oh. will not be back when Pete Carroll said he's going to be back. That is my official Interesting. Jason, do you take. agree with that? Because that's a, a pretty strong take for somebody that, you know, Carson's on a lot of dynasty teams, a lot of keeper leagues. We love him. Yeah, I mean, the reality is this could very well be the truth. I don't think Pete Carroll would lie if this was the truth, but – what Mike's saying is true that in the past we've had Pete Carroll give really short timelines, really rosy uh, analysis on players that were injured. You know, a lot of love went to Doug Baldwin last year. I was going to say, Doug Baldwin was going to be perfectly fine. Because Pete Carroll said, you know, things were great and they were obviously much worse than he was letting on. So it, it's not good news. That's why I say, quote, worse than uh, n- no work being done because we don't know the truth of what the work – was and when he's going to be back we right now have to say he's going to be back in a couple weeks be ready for training camp but it does give monitor an, it gives an opportunity to Rashad Penny to show uh, you know to take the ball first if Carson isn't there when OTA is open and it, you know yeah so and Brooks just put this in that, that Pete Carroll was very vague on all details like when Carson actually had the surgery I mean, he just this this is bad news for Chris Carson man Okay, uh, NFL Network reports uh, Cowboys and Zeke are on the same page in regards to a contract extension that will make him the highest paid running back in NFL history. I want to clarify something that we said on the show with the interaction with Ezekiel Elliott and the forearm shiver and the thing that showed sure. up. 
Um, it was not a security guard. It was an event staff member. Uh, it's oh. it's worth a clarity sure. point because, you know, security guard, police officer, that could enter into a different territory, potentially, of, of offense. Um, but it, it's going to get him all the money in the world, apparently. So, yeah. Uh, Matt Burita dealing with a slightly torn pectoral muscle. The 49ers expect him to be ready for training camp. 49ers Raheem oh, Mostert required, mustard. required a redo of the surger, of his surgery to repair his broken arm, if you remember last year. Whoa, Colonel that Muster, was... Uh, not good. Not good with the arm. But he was re-signed to a three-year contract because all the running backs. <laughs> uh, the Matt Burita news, uh, they expect him ready for camp. Not good news on a backfield where you are, you know, trying to basically establish yourself as a rotational player with Jarek McKinnon, Tevin Coleman, Coleman, the, the newly, uh, both of them are brand new to the team, really, because McKinnon didn't get to play last year with the ACL. Matt Burita was the incumbent, and he's going to be on the shelf for a while. So not good news. All right. Uh, Tyler Croft suffered a broken foot. Greg Olson medically cleared. Greg Olson's in that value sleeper category for us on yeah, the show. Yes, it's, it's hard to know what to do with Greg Olson because you have that three-year span of him just he'd being great for fantasy football. Uh, and, of course, he had the foot problem this past season, but even before he went down with the foot problem, he just was really not involved in the offense. And then Delaney Walker says he is at 85%. Is Delaney Walker somebody yes. we should be talking about he'll, more? He'll end up in the – He'll end up like t tight end eight to ten or so. Yeah, I mean he's good. He when he comes back, he's probably in that ninety target range, right. and that's you know there's not a lot of tight ends that command that. So both Delaney Walker and Greg Olson are kind of the old forgotten coming back off of injuries that you don't want, but they might be okay. Yeah, they're they're not talked about a lot. They're not exciting. They're not top five, but they're you know when they're on the field and they are healthy, they're probably going to be relevant. That was today's news and notes. By the way, we always remind you, the offseason is the time to come to your commissioner. Mm -hmm. Rule changes, getting the league in order. It's also a good time to ask if you're using the right platform. Check out the Sleeper app, the Sleeper platform. Uh, I've seen some polls recently on social media asking people where they're playing, and, and more and more people are playing on Sleeper because uh, this is a platform that always changes and improves. So that's what I love about it. Hey, before we jump into the mailbag, we have a message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration known as NHTSA. Look, you may have said this. I'm not going very far. I'm in a rush. It's too uncomfortable. Don't kid yourself. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. If you've used these excuses, you're putting yourself at risk of injury or death in 2017. More than 10,000 people were unbuckled when they were killed in crashes. No matter what kind of vehicle you drive, wearing your seatbelt is the best defense in a crash. Even if you're in the back seat, buckle up. That goes for when you ride in taxis, when you're using a ride-sharing service. Cops are on the lookout, and they're writing tickets. Why take the risk? In 2017 alone, seatbelts saved nearly 15,000 lives. People, come on. Buckle up. Do the smart thing. Buckle up every trip. Day or night, click it or tick it. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say that it's it's just not worth I would not be able to forgive myself if I took a chance one time as a dad. Right. I mean, that's... It's just dumb. Just it's lazy. Dumb. All right. Let's get into the mailbag. Mailbag. Bag or bag. Mike was about to take a sip of that was, his water. We were about a half second from disaster. I thought that was going to, like, Finding Nemo doing the mailbag drop. <laughs> I thought that's what we were going to get. Um, <laughs> you sounded a little bit like a dolphin there. Uh, but you came through. I appreciate it. If you have a question for the Fantasy Footballers podcast, go to the website, click the Submit a Question button. Jason, did you know you can also dial the voicemail hotline? I knew that, but... Please don't ask me what the line is. 302-464-TFFB <laughs> if you want to leave a voicemail question for the show. We are here for the fantasy football community. Do you know why the last four digits are TFFB, Jason? Uh, the fantasy footballers. Excellent. So smart. That was pretty good. Thank you. That was pretty Just, good. It was, uh, we've it done how many? Second. 800 shows. Probably mentioned that 600 times. <laughs> so I'm glad. In Jason's defense... I would not know what it Did, was. Either. You didn't. You wouldn't uh, not off the top of my head. You guys just tune out at that point. Yeah, you've done your mailbag drop. Honestly, most of the time when you're talking, Jason and I have checked out. Mm -hmm. When he says, "What do you think, Jason?" I go, 
Oh shoot! Yeah. What did he say? It's like it was like it's a it's a throwback to when just you're just me and you, Brooks. <laughs> when you're in school, just me and you, and you get called wah, on by wah, the teacher. Wah, wah. Wah, wah, it's like, wah, wah, wah. Jason, what Bru- do you think? And you go, <gasps> come on, brain. It's in there somewhere. You heard it. You heard what we were talking about. Important question, Brooks, since it's just you and I here today. And it is the mailbag. I got a question for you. Sandra Bullock in the 90s. Were you on board? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's three to one. Just making clear. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and kick it off with a voicemail. Hey, ballers. This is Alec from Min- Minnesota. I'm the commissioner of a 12-team league entering its fifth year, but at least four people want to join the league, and I feel bad turning them away each and every year. How do you recommend going about this? Should I start a new league with 16 teams, or should I have some sort of system for people to enter the league? Thanks, guys. Love the show. Well, that's a tough question. That's It's a league decision, too. Like This is not something you can just, as the commissioner – come down and say people we've got a waiting list and these are our friends we wanted to get them in forever so we're making the league a lot bigger because going from 12 to 14 doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal it's huge it's a very large deal when it comes to the waiver wire and the availability of players and just how deep your roster this is actually going to be four people so that you know right. you talked about going to a, to a 16, 16 team league 16 that would- teams are in is intense it, yeah it's it's fun that can work and if the whole league is behind it then sure i know in our in our league of record we've always had a waiting list right we've we've had it for years and most years nobody leaves the league and so you don't get in but one thing that we found happened naturally in our league is co-owners these people that were on the waiting list they want to be involved they want to be in the community of the you know we have a Facebook group. They want to be in the group. They want to talk about the league. And they know other people in the league, which is why they're on this particular waiting list. And so, you know, one of the one of the owners was like, hey, I'll take this guy, you know, as my co-owner. And, yeah. and really nobody – They get to come to the draft. They get to participate. Nobody has taken over a team in our league without pr- already being a co-owner of another team in quite some time. And I'll just uh, reiterate what Mike said. You know, it is a big deal because it will change your league. Don't believe that it won't change the dynamics of your league. Right. If everybody's on board, cool. But your league will change. I mean, it will be different. There's dynamics with that big of a league. And if you have a really well-run league, I understand kind of Don't touch waffling it. on messing with it. You, and, and you can. I mean, we, we, we had another situation where there's a lot of people that wanted in a league, and I started a new dynasty league. You know, it's right. like if you've got the resources of the time – to yeah, but we call that league Dyni- Dynasty Junior. Dino you Junior. call it Dino Junior. Actually, yeah. I, I also call it Dino Junior. Yeah, it's a good name. It's catchy. Yeah, it's like the little it's also a band. little brother of the real league. Yeah, you guys are both <laughs> co-owners in that league as well. Right. Um, yeah, that's as close as we're touching Dino <laughs> Junior. All right, this question comes in from B. Kellner. Which players would you move up in your rankings for best ball drafts? Mm, so guys who are going to get you those just the, the burst week, the – Traquan Smith. Really? Sure. I mean, not that he's way up in the rankings, but that's the category of player I'm looking at. Somebody that is uh, on the field frequently, but uh, a lot of people aren't projecting consistency from. That You know, Tyrell Williams last year would have been a good example. Maybe Tyrell this year is a good example. But, you know, you look at the inconsistent player and you move them up a little bit if they give you burst games, right? Yeah, and at running back, I like looking – later in drafts at the pass catching running back that's always left for dead year after year after year Theo Riddick comes to Austin mind. Eckler Austin Eckler I mean even James White he's not gonna be super late in drafts but you can have consistent production you don't have to always have boom bust guys um, but to Andy's point on that is a guy like Amari Cooper who he, at the end of the year he's gonna have scored a ton of fantasy points he's gonna be a top 12 wide receiver but oftentimes he's done it in a way that hurts you on a getting wins this week because he he just doesn't show up for a game. That doesn't hurt you as much because he's on your bench that week. Sure. Sidetrack question. Yeah. I just thought of it when you mentioned Austin Eckler. I just wanted to get your guys' take real quick because we haven't talked about it. Is Austin Eckler still your handcuff for Melvin Gordon or is it Justin Jackson? I don't. I I don't think I've ever really thought of Eckler as, a, as the handcuff. But he was, well, he was the handcuff in terms of if Melvin Gordon went down, 
Austin Eckler was going to be the running back who was going to see a very significant increase in his volume. I think that's what they had done. And right. and, then and they done, gave him the chance to do that at times, and he didn't really do it. Right, but I mean, it, he was still going to be the guy, and then he was injured, and Justin Jackson rose to the occasion. It was, I mean, and essentially he, one game of Justin Jackson being the starter, but he was great. Yeah, he, he showed well. So I was just curious if you guys had put in any – any, any thought into Justin Jackson? I would still rather own Eckler myself okay. than Jackson in the scenario that Gordon. Like you take Gordon away today, I'd rather have I'd rather have Eckler. That that answers that question. I don't know if you guys agree. Uh, I agree that I would rather have Eckler in general. I think what Justin Jackson has done is made it to where no one is a true handcuff. Okay. I don't think that I think it would be a one-two punch with those guys. And as yeah, I agree with you, but I, I Eckler would catch more passes, so that's sure. probably why I lean that way. Um. All right, let's go to Fantasy Football Advanced. Sends in this question. How crazy is it to consider starting a draft where you have the last pick with the Mahomes-Kelsey stack? So if you have the last pick in the draft, how crazy is it to consider going Mahomes-Kelsey at the turn? I'm Especially in a 10-team league so where you could still get good running backs. So they're asking, oh, is like the Mahomes-Kelsey end-of-round stack, does it make sense no, Kelsey and a in, running back makes sense. In a one two? <laughs> like you're you're the turn on a, on yes. a one two? Please don't do that. I mean, look, it's fun. It sounds cool, but Please here's what's gonna happen. That. Your third pick does not come for a long time. I know you mean your first running back or wide receiver? Your first running back or wide receiver are going to be so late and then you don't just need one of those guys. You need a whole lot of those. You need players. four minimum. Yes. Between the two. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't do it because whatever positional advantage you get with Mahomes and Kelsey, I feel like you're you're losing at the other positions straight off the bat. But then, as the season goes on, your depth for injuries and bye weeks and other things are ruined in addition to the actual starters being ruined. Yeah, I mean, the, the situation with Mahomes in general this year, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of noise around you have to take Mahomes early from other analysts or shows or uh, articles and that noise should mean that you get an advantage in your league when you pass on him and you let somebody else take Mahomes too early it's just going to make the next best running back tight end or wide receiver move down your draft board and the the argument for and taking it makes us feel anti Mahomes to constantly reiterate <laughs> that fact when it's not like we discount Mahomes as a, he's our number one quarterback on all of our boards. Yeah, he's an elite player. He's he's top tier when it comes to fantasy football. Uh, but the the thing about spending the high draft pick on Mahomes is you are saying I am betting that Mahomes is going to be that much better than the quarterback two than the quarterback three. Uh, he's giving me such a weekly advantage at this position that's actually very replaceable when what he did was uh, you, I'm not going to take it away from him certainly not but there's only been three times in history in the history of the NFL that a quarterback has thrown 50 or more touchdowns and you guys realize it's only been 13 times that a quarterback has thrown 40 or more and that's that's the range that Mahomes has to be in he has to be in the 40 touchdown range to be giving you any type of of advantage that's worth it and remember last year i mean last year we were sitting here talking about the number one quarterback in fantasy do you remember who it was last year was it wasn't rogers it was russell wilson russell wilson Ooh. finished as oh, the yes, number one finished, quarterback yes. yeah and so uh, you know the risk of turnover at the position the unsustainability of numbers that you know historically look i think mahomes ha has as good a chance of anybody in nfl history being in the system with Andy Reid and the, and the weapons that he has to be in that 40 range. But he has to be, if you spend yes. that high of a pick, to just break even like on if, your investment. If you want to go early in quarterback, which we do not recommend, but if you're like, I got to have that early stack, Hopkins, Deshaun Watson, that's the that's absolutely the way I would go if I was had my mindset, I've got to get a Hop, new, You're saying Watson stack. at... At a greater value, yes, I would like take, third round pick exactly, and, and right. I would I would also add the T. Y. Hilton Andrew Luck stack sure. as a, a better value if you want to stack. All right, voicemail question. Hey, this is Adam in St. Louis, and I mean, 
a 12 team, two keeper league, and I'm trying to decide. I have OBJ, AJ Green, and Devonta Freeman. Of course, I'm keeping OBJ, but I have no idea who to keep between the injured Green and Freeman. Yeah, that's that's tough. Those guys are very similar. They've been yeah. dominant in the past. They've been, you know, top of their position. They're a little older now for their respective position, and they're both coming off injuries and are injury risks going forward. So, to me, because it's kind of a toss-up about the same, they're drafted around each other, I'm going to lean running back. I'm yep. going to take the extra running back and go Freeman with OBJ. I'll take Freeman. I will concur. Also got a little sleeper update just now. <laughs> Nothing official, but... Kyle Rudolph has confirmed a five-year extension discussion is happening right now with the Minnesota Vikings. Well, wait, what? Go. What happened? I thought I everything broke know, down. I don't know, but if you're looking at dynasty leagues, oh man, Irv Smith drafters are, are freaking out. Yeah, I mean that is. Um, you just threw your pick in the dumpster. <laughs> five-year extension potentially. He just seems like he belongs on Minnesota for a little while longer. He is a Where else very, would you want him to disappoint fantasy owners? He is. See, here's, right? Here's the, here's the hard thing <laughs> with Kyle Rudolph. Is he's a good football player. Is he's, he's a great, great football, football player. player. He's yes. so good for the Vikings. So good as an NFL tight end. He can catch. He's a great run blocker. But he's disappointing for fantasy. So yeah. we're so like, we hate there's him. no, there's no position. There's no position in football, you know, that's like the tight end position where you can be an absolute fabulous NFL tight end and be completely – annoying and irrelevant in fantasy football. I mean, that position, you don't get points for, for blocking, protecting the quarterback, picking up a blitz, you know, downfield blocking. You don't get points for any of that. And that's why we hate you, Kyle. Um, all right. No, we don't. We no, we you. don't. Good Which, friend of the show. He's yeah, been on he's the show. Yeah, he's actually been on the show. I take everything back I said. Uh, congrats on the extension, <laughs> potentially. Which San Francisco running back would you draft first? That is the question from Dewell99. Now, there are 99 running backs to choose from, so that is a good name. Yes. Which one would you draft first? I have been very vocal about the fact that I believe Matt Burita is the best value because he is being drafted about 20 spots behind either McKinnon or Coleman. But would you draft the one peck man as the first oh, running back? Oh, come on. Yeah, yes, I would. One and a half, fine. I'll as give if, him a half. I mean, look, one and I, a half. I'm not, I don't want to just be stupid. Like, if you have an injury, like Matt Burita had injuries all last year. Yes, he did. He played through them, still ran for 5.2 a carry. I do think it's a plug-and-play situation in San Francisco. So if Burita's hurt, if that goes and extends into the season, um, Tevin Coleman and McKinnon are both seventh-round picks right now. I would, not, I would not say I would take Burita first today. If I'm you, drafting you just today, like the value. I like the value, but McKinnon in the seventh round could be a great value if Breed is hurt. So if you asked me today, I'd probably say McKinnon. I, I would definitely be McKinnon. Yeah, I am as well. I it, think the I think the the most people do buy into it, Tevin Coleman should be the first one taken. If we get into training camp and the news today, Breed yeah. is fine and, and you know they're sharing reps all over the place, that's that's a different story. I'll take the best value in that sure. situation. Uh, this question comes in. Well, let's go to another voicemail. Hey, ballers. My name is Michael, and I'm calling out of Chicago. I am the commissioner of my fantasy football league, and I was really hoping to start a dynasty league this upcoming year. Um, but I didn't want to do it without an overall consensus approval from my league mates. So what could I say to convince any skeptics about starting a dynasty league? Thanks. So you're talking about approval from the league. So I don't know if it's starting a new dynasty league, which is awesome. No, it's converting. Or converting. It's converting. Yeah. yeah, it sounded like converting. Yeah. And you can't go consensus on converting to a dynasty. I mean, this needs to be Unanimous. literally everybody. Yeah, and he's wanting to know how we pitch them on making right. that transition. How would you go to a league that's been a redraft league for years? Um, you know, the commissioner wants to – basically add to the investment and, and say, hey, we want to make this a dynasty league. A lot of people understand that that means you get, you know, off-season activity and fun and rookie draft and trading, and maybe that's my pitch. That, that, is, that the, is the pitch. The, the pitch is that a, a great, well-functioning dynasty league is active 365 days a year. You, as, soon as, the, the, as soon as a champion is crowned, People are, hey, let's talk traits. You know, what's going on here? I want to improve my team. I'm trying to position 
for the draft because I've got these players that I think are at great risk of being displaced because of of the NFL draft coming up. So that's that's the pitch is it is it goes to a year round type of of a situation, but it's just it's just so different. I don't necessarily think that my, one is better. Yeah, my pitch. I mean, this is just for, if if I were the one doing it, my pitch would be let's start another league that's a dynasty league right. because they're very very different. And here's the here's the pitch part that you people are going to say, well, I don't want to take on all that that more you know more work. A dynasty league and a redraft or a keeper league, they fit so well together because in season, there's not that much to do in a dynasty league. There's really not. You're not doing daily waivers. I mean, there's there's very few people on the waiver wire that you're just – it's not the same as redraft. The moves aren't quite as active. But in the off season, when your redraft league is doing nothing, there's so much to do in a dynasty league. I think they fit well together. And I would pitch it as that because the one thing you don't want to do, like I remember the when we first started getting into Dynasty, I was like, uh, you know, I I so much prefer redraft or keeper because that's what you were used to. And if if these people aren't entirely on board and you shift the league and now they lose what what they've loved, I don't know. That would you know, yeah, I would add. All right, this question comes in from Liam in New Hampshire. Neeson, I don't. Or what, so. wait, wait, was Liam uh, from uh, Oasis? Wasn't it Liam Gallagher? That was his name. I think I. There's really no way to know, Mike. It's one of those. It's one two. Of it the probably two. is. I'm just saying. Uh, as you often do. You should read it in a British accent in honor of I Liam Gallagher. I will do no such thing. How much do Jason? off-season changes? I, I'll, I, when Jason tries to do a British accent, there's no, no. I want him to back a, me up and pressure you to do this. Yeah, I love your British accent. It's really good. It's so on point. How much do <laughs> off-season changes on defense affect your rankings? Was that it's a just, I, I think. I think. Did you this, roll your R? I went. I went to Dumbledore <laughs> because went, I believe that somehow that was British. But like Dumbledore visiting Spain. <laughs> Rankings, Harry. Uh, ranking. <laughs> I can't even roll my R at you, all. You at, can you guys roll your R's? <laughs> you both can? Yeah. yeah. Here's how it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> it used, that's a car not you, starting. Yes, yeah, it's a lawnmower that you can't get moving. So I can't do the snake <laughs> sound, and I can't roll my R's, okay. and I can't speak in a British right. Real quick, I was unable to hear a word of that question. Uh, start over in Andy's accent. How much do off-season <laughs> changes on defense affect your rankings for offensive players for example for example tyran matthew to the chiefs harry yeah, it doesn't it doesn't change my rankings. so the only way that i think that it really changes my rankings, like uh, there have been times when top profile dbs enter a division like when um uh what am i remembering with washington when they added norman yeah and they already had, you know, some higher profile DBs. And you looked at it and you said, wow, Dez might have a hard time this season going up against Norman twice and then his schedule. I mean, I thought about it then. But yeah, there are certain situations like that. The only other times that I, I think about it is with what happened last year. So, like, the, the Falcons, you brought them up uh, earlier. And the, the atrocities that happened to their defense when it comes to injuries at the beginning of the year. They, had a, they have a good defense but they had a terrible defense. So, like, I look at that in, in the sense that they're not going to need to score 400 points to go under 500 like they did last year. And so I, it kind of downgrades their offense for me when I think their defense is going to be much, much better. That That's kind of how it affects me. But in you, you can't overdo that. Projecting defense is just very hard to do. Yeah, because it's 11-plus yes. people. All right, uh, this next question comes in from Kyle in Texas. Is it time to sell Julian Edelman in a half-point PPR Dynasty League while he still has value? To me. He's currently my number one flex option. If so, what could I get in return for him? Before you guys just say no, because I know we all like Julian Edelman, I will say there have been situations in Dynasty Leagues where, you know, look, Jordy Nelson was interesting for a second, and this then he was gone, like just done. This to to me it depends on this team. He says, "Okay, Julian Edelman's my flex. 
well, are you a team that can compete this year? Are you a team? Because I don't think you're going to trade Julian Edelman for a better fantasy option this year. That's why I say, that's why I lean no. Because the reason you're thinking about trading him is the same reason somebody doesn't want to trade for him. Right, and so Which if, is age. if you're trading to a contender and you're in a rebuild, that makes a lot of sense. But if you can compete this year and win the title, I think you're going to hurt your team trading him for the future and saying, I'm going to win next year or the next year. The problem, like, you're just, for me, trading Edelman is what are you actually going to get? I mean, even from a, I'd say I'm a contender, I want to buy Julian Edelman. I'm giving you draft picks. Yeah, I'm, but I'm like a second. If you were going to do it, you'd do it after he starts hot. Like if you're a rebuilding team, let him start hot sure, this season. That would be much better. Prove himself and then trade him if you're not in contention. Just saying, even if I'm a rebuilding team, I would rather have Edelman on my roster in case things turn around quickly. Like we just He just got an extension. Yeah, two-year two so year extension. So if you have three years of Julian Edelman, let's say he's great for two of them, I'm not trading that away for a second-round pick. That's not worth it to me. All right, this question from ant.rvb says, Jason, how is your snack count? Oh, it's still 100%. Unfortunately, I can't get it below 100%. I try, <laughs> I try to like take uh, a break, but then it's like it's always 100. Always 100. All right, uh, Eli Worster says, who is the better breakout candidate, Christian Kirk? Or Anthony Miller? That is a great question. Let's just all formulate that in your head and then say it at the same time, either Kirk or Miller, okay? Formulate okay. the answer. You ready? I've yep. got my answer. All right, three, two, one, Kirk. Kirk. Oh. There we go. My reason, so I love Anthony Miller. I do too. Yeah. My reason for worrying at all about Anthony Miller is that his touchdown rate you, you look at him and you go, oh, man, in limited action, he was dealing with injury. He had seven touchdowns as a rookie, so he's going to be this touchdown machine. That's not how touchdowns work in the NFL. That's not what happens year to year. His He has a, you know, the touchdown rate will come down for Anthony Miller. If that comes down, it's going to be difficult for him to then break out. A breakout player is somebody who's going to have all of his metrics rise, and you think, okay, Anthony Miller had – you know, portions where Allen Robinson was dealing with injuries and, you know, he, he had uh, – Yeah, Trey uh, Burton missed some time. Other players missed some time. He, he filled had, in. And he had uh, the offense already doing better. The offense for Arizona last year was atrocious. And, and you know, I don't think Anthony Miller can overtake Allen Robinson as the one this year. Christian Kirk could overtake Larry Fitzgerald yeah, yeah, as yeah. the he, one this year. Uh, absolutely could. He's 22 years old. Larry Fitzgerald's 35 years old. Christian Kirk has played with Kyler Murray. Mm -hmm. As a freshman at Texas A&M. I mean, this is a uh, a situation where they have a relationship. Kirk is a young, up-and-coming receiver. Again, it's not projecting that it will happen, but you asked for the best candidate, and he has the chance to be the number one on the team. And Kirk absolutely flashed last year. I mean, you talked about – Yeah, 590 yards last year with Josh The Rosen. Cardinals' offense was terrible, and the one bright spot was the potential you could see from Christian Kirk turning into an actual fantasy star. Um, absolutely. A, a quick reminder, we do have some tickets available for our live tour. You can go to BallersLive.com, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, L.A., Phoenix. Check that out at BallersLive.com. Grab tickets while you can. We should just start saying Midwest instead of Chicago. Oh, mm. yeah, because uh, from what I understand, Chicago is in the Midwest. Right, and so if you are also in the Midwest, we'll see you in Chicago. Um, and then uh, let's do this. Pristine. All right, Melvin Gordon signed Los Angeles Chargers jersey yesterday at pristineauction.com, just like the blue Keenan Allen one we've got on the wall. So you've got the Melvin Gordon ver version with Melvin Gordon's autograph. $67. That's a smoking deal. And there's a really cool new promotion Pristine Auction is doing. It's always free to go and browse all the hundreds of daily auctions, sports memorabilia at pristineauction.com. But right now, if you use the registration code BALLERS on sign up, you get five bucks free and clear to go towards your first memorabilia purchase. So five bucks, use the registration code BALLERS at pristineauction.com. Before Mike? we close, I'm looking at a map of the United States. The way you got, you were talking about Chicago, it's the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And I 
Test my geography here because well, it's terrible. No, no, no. But it, in that area, like Minnesota, it's it's the Midwest. But if you look at a map, I don't know why we call it. Oh, the, I've. Why is it not just look? Everything's west of it. To me, it's that. Uh, is it the Mississippi rule? Everything west of the East Coast. <laughs> but I, mean, I mean, like you draw a line right down the middle. What? I don't know why you would refer what to that it? as the Midwest. I it's am more curious. east than it is west. Yes, especially Chicago. What is everything Jason knows about the Midwest in 60 seconds? Oh, oh. that is a great question. All everything right. you I'll, know I'll about the Midwest so, in 60 seconds, the, Jason. The Midwest is uh, known as the upper north middle of the United States, mm. uh, if they don't refer to it as the Midwest. It includes such states as Illinois and, <laughs> and Minnesota. Um and, and and also um are you looking at a map right now <laughs> Indiana and still, and still struggling uh, Indiana Michigan <laughs> okay uh, there are great lakes in the uh Midwest I know that here's what one thing I really do know about the Midwest fantastic food mm. it is not healthy for you mm. it is uh, probably where i will go to retire for that reason <laughs> alone I'm, I'm interested in these lakes what do you know about and they the, love football the lakes the especially the names of the great lakes yeah there's lake, lake lake erie uh-huh ah oh, crap <laughs> lake lake uh with two key <laughs> 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 The more you know. Thank you, Jason. You Thank you I very will. much. Um, I'm surprised. Yeah, I should know another one. Yes, I'm probably. surprised you didn't. T like, if you asked me about the Midwest, I think about those insane tornadoes going on. Yes, stay. that's the Midwest, right? Is it? I feel like yeah. that's the central. No, that I mean that's the mid. But I think is that area called the Midwest though? Brooks is the only one that can possibly speak to this because we are horribly illiterate. Arizona fools Brooks like, where is the Midwest according to you who is you grew up in Michigan yeah I, I think I'd be I think more north like that like Michigan Wisconsin Ohio some of those states. so what is know. Oklahoma what are where are they are uh, they know. part of the south I don't no. know but I, I feel like I, I wouldn't call them Midwest I know they're in, I don't know if that's accurate Ohio in the, is Midwest yeah it's Ohio right yeah right below Michigan Ohio is so far <laughs> east why is this in the Midwest I don't know Geography from the Fantasy Footballers. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. All your support. We'll be back soon with another episode. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>you for listening to another episode of the fantasy footballers podcast join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on twitter at the ff ballers